Hey everyone, and welcome to the first official ActuaTech podcast. Now, ActuaTech seeks technological solutions for traditional actuarial problems. And in this episode, we're looking at blockchain technology and how it can be applied to the actuarial problem of managing investment funds. So joining me today is Jonti from Invictus and Louis from Revix. And I must say, thank you guys so much for giving up your evening to, to be part of this. So maybe should we start with some quick introductions on your side? Um, I don't know if you guys can jot. Give me your age, what you studied, and what you did before crypto. So John T, shall we, shall we start with you? Okay, thanks. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, Michael. Um, and I'm looking forward to discussing further, Louis. Um, so uh, my name is John T. I am 28 years old. I studied at University of Stellenbosch. I did a Bachelor of Commerce in Economics uh, with a side minor of um, philosophy. Um, and uh, the, my, my interest has always been around um, uh, different approaches to economics, um, specifically incentives for individuals and you know, obviously like individualism and, and libertarian philosophies and sort of reconciling that with sort of like our complex um, world that we live in where we need like socially scalable systems and, and things like that to accommodate like the, the big challenges we face and things like education, healthcare, um, sustainable energy and development, um, solving crises like poverty and um, uh, other, other kinds of conflicts around uh, different ideologies and, and uh, resource constraints and things like that. And um, as a result, I've been looking into um, uh, various kinds of exponential technologies since uh, my undergrad. I did that in, uh, between 2012 and 2014. And I've basically been looking into everything from uh, biotechnology, uh, space technology, seeing our, our good friend Elon Musk working hard in uh, SpaceX, uh, and um, you know, various technologies specifically in the startup space where like, individuals can come together and build something interesting. So I became aware of Bitcoin um, when I was actually looking toward using it as a means of payment for charities. Um, obviously the big one was uh, WikiLeaks, um, but another one which was sort of an interesting use case for Bitcoin at the time was uh, looking to help raise funding for sort of like unpopular or like un, um, sort of like contrarian uh, uh, charities. Um, one of them I was interested in is uh, one called Sense Research Foundation um, that funny enough, uh, Vitalik donated $2.4 million toward. Uh, they basically do rejuvenation biotech for ending age-related diseases. So some pretty sort of far out things there that can't get funded by peer-reviewed science. So long story short, that's sort of what got me interested in crypto, sort of saying, hey, this is quite interesting, sort of like uncensorable payment, um, sort of pseudo-anonymous um, and uh, just, just sort of global and really cool. And obviously like most people think crypto initially sort of doesn't make sense. Like I immediately saw that use case because you, you'd be surprised how uh, scared people are to like, even if they're like billionaires to like donate to these charities because they're worried what people think of them or like you know, their spouses or colleagues or investors or whoever would say about them. Um, or even just, you know, governments, obviously, um, in the case of WikiLeaks. Anyway, so uh, that's sort of what got me into crypto. I've also got a background in Edutech. I worked at a company called uh, Get Smarter. Um, I think I know one of your colleagues, Ashley Young. Uh, his name oh is yes, mine. yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, obviously heard from him. You're big into uh, race cars and things like that. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, the, go go karting. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the funny thing with Ashley is, I mean, yeah, his name's Ashley Young, like the Manchester United player, and my name being Michael yeah. Jordan. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, oh, Michael Jordan and Ashley Young are are drinking beer together. So no, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. And no, so literally, I started working with him in 2015, and literally on my like, first couple of days, I was working next to him and said, hey, have you seen the Bitcoin price? And it was something like 5,000 Rand of Bitcoin. This was like back in like 2015. I was like, jeez, hey, this thing's <laughs> going places. Um, so, uh, so, so basically, I came from a background in Edutech. Um, Get Smarter is an online um, course pr uh, provider that works in universities that uh, recently got sold in uh, 2017 for $100 million. Um, that is the Paddock Brothers from Rhonda Bosch. So my, my background really came from seeing how these interesting companies in Cape Town actually scaled to, 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 um, to big successes. They got sold to 2U, which is a New York Stock Exchange traded company, or sorry, NASDAQ traded company. No, anyway, so one of the courses they were doing was called the MIT FinTech course. Um, Ashley and I um, helped distribute that um, on behalf of the MIT Media Lab. 
Um, and then basically on, that was in 2016, and we just saw this huge influx of people interested in blockchain, Bitcoin, ICOs, all this stuff, uh, Ethereum, smart contracts, uh, everything in between. And we basically got in touch with entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, a lot of different people involved in different spaces from healthcare to IT and um, security that were interested in this thing. I was like, wow, this thing's going places. So yeah, that's how I got involved in crypto in 2017 and eventually joined the, the Invictus team. Now, look, that's just myself, but uh, Invictus, I need to give a full-on other introduction. So I'll just leave it for there, and then we'll go into like what I'm doing now that's for the more crypto side. Okay, yeah. perfect. Well, yeah, Louis, do you want to give us your, your take? It's your... Yeah. Well, what was the question again? So <laughs> your, I want to know your, your age, what you studied, and yeah, what you did before crypto. All right, okay, cool. Um, yeah, that's it. As you said, my name is Lee. I am now 26. Um, sure, before crypto, I'm just like dredging back there. <laughs> so I studied, I studied mechatronic engineering um, first at UCT. And then I studied in honors in computer science after that. And so I was sufficiently nerdy when I left university. <laughs> um, so by, I was about 2015, I think. And then I'd always been in some sort of startup from since I can remember, probably high school, um, ranging from Internet of Things, like before it was called that, <laughs> um, through to point of sale software for like university shops and things like that. Um, so probably by the end of my honors in computer science, I was pretty, yeah, I was, I was having a good time. Ended up spending some time in San Francisco doing a course at the business school at Stanford. That was the last thing I studied. Um, and we had an opportunity to come back to South Africa to co-found two companies, one in corporate communication, which is linked to how I actually <laughs> actually learned about crypto in the beginning. Um, it was called, are we trying to call it Ripple, as in information rippling <laughs> through like an organization. And it was essentially a, a hybrid between WhatsApp and Slack, which is now WhatsApp for business, which is a good thing while we can do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But essentially, we were building, we built that up for clients such as SAP Nigeria, Apollo World locally, but best locally. Um, and essentially, we were looking for the dot-com domain at that point. And I was like, who is this payments company, Ripple, thinking they are? <laughs> what are they doing? Do they not understand? We're trying to like change the world of corporate communication here. <laughs> the first thing, when I started looking at it, I was like, wow, this is quite interesting, actually. Um, and then the second company there was a, a company called Carry School Payment, um, which we essentially, uh, eventually, long story short, uh, partnered with NetBank on, and I exited that last two years ago, in long story. Uh, but essentially, that was my first touch, my first touch point on payments, the industry in general. And that's kind of where the two met, the, and like having a look at this Ripple webpage while working on payments with NetBank. I, like, I put the two together immediately, thinking like, my God, like, this whole system is proper fucked up. <laughs> like mm -hmm. um, from there, I mean, I mean, crypto was just the next kind of wave on that. Um, we had a look at launching a an Ethereum on ramp, probably in early 2016. Never managed to get around to it. Got a bit busy, but since then, probably end of last year, uh, no, beginning mid last year, co-founded Revix, um, which is basically a digital asset management platform. Um, as we get more into the classical financial space, but at the moment we basically buy bundled um, investment products uh, in the crypto space. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, if you answered your question, not that sure. Yeah, you got to you got to keep us to task here, because otherwise well, I, maybe something I can just jump in there. I, um, funnily enough, we we know Carrie, um, my colleague, actually knew Doug a while back, and the mates uh, from Carrie yeah, as well. Cool. Um, and I also, also saw there you you had a run in with. Um, uh, knife, knife capital, right? No, knife capital. So no, 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 no. My partner, my partner at Revit, Sean Sanders, spent some time at knife capital. Oh, so, sure. yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was actually going to say, yeah. Uh, so our founder was actually funded by knife a while back. That's funny. Yeah, funny a, data, a data profit. Yeah. Data profit. Yeah. So we we got such a the small. This space is pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Um, data science plus fintech. And, Cape Town, South Africa, small, but um, as we've learned, uh, the rest of the world's quite big. Um, okay, that, that, that's, well, that, that's interesting. Well, guys, let, yeah, let, me, mean, let me maybe start off with, uh, with a difficult question. With maybe one, maybe let's start off with the hardest question, and then the rest will be a little bit, sure. a little bit easier. And the reason why I do this is because, John T., you, you spoke about how you studied philosophy. And 
you know, both both of your companies, you know, that you've created uh, make these crypto funds. You know, they let you manage and hold cryptocurrencies on investors' behalf. But now, isn't one of the core philosophies of Bitcoin, or wasn't yeah, one of the core philosophies of Bitcoin, that people should be in control of their own finances, their own assets? You know, you kind of see that slogan on a lot of the wallets, be your own bank. Now, by having someone else, else hold your Bitcoin, doesn't that defeat one of the, the big reasons for adopting this technology in, in the first place? You want to get right into it, eh? <laughs> so yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to know who wants to go first. I'm happy to, well, you said you said you study philosophy. I'm happy happy to go at it unless, unless Louis has an initial thought. So this is this is a very interesting one. Um, we we get this question from time to time. So just a bit of background. So yeah, we created uh, an index fund, and just for clarity, I'm not one of the co-founders. That that would be Daniel, um, Luke, his brother, and uh, their colleagues uh, Matthew and Ray. So they were four co-founders that created Crypto Twenty in. Um, middle of 2017 and they did an ICO. So they tokenized that fund and raised $40 million for it. So Crypto20, um, the idea behind that was sort of trying to meet that problem halfway. The one thing is that Crypto20 allows you to do is to hold a token that is uh, um, effectively allows you to redeem for the equivalent value of the underlying fund um, back in Ether using a smart contract. So it sort of caters to the crypto uh, enthusiasts because they're like holding their coins, so to speak. Now, the tricky thing is, as people have realized and probably got the companies like Coinbase have really capitalized on this, right now, um, yes, at layer one, people should be in control of their money, so to speak, but really layer two, layer three, and upwards of the payments uh, and the financial infrastructure system, people want a simple interface and they want they want to pay for the, the and, and give up um, responsibility and autonomy and uh, control of their private keys and their money in, 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 um, in exchange for convenience and a, a great user interface. So I think where we come in and say is, look, we, we understand that. So especially when it comes to managing a portfolio of 10 to 20 crypto assets and you have to manage staking, masternodes, um, re weekly rebalancing that we do and um, and also avoiding scams like BitConnect, like we did, and people sort of blamed us for doing that at the time. They were happy we did avoid it when they crashed, things like that, right? So, so people are willing to give up some form of um, uh, control. That being said, that doesn't attack the fundamental thesis of Bitcoin and, and crypto assets and cryptocurrency, which is at the layer one in terms of how money is created and distributed and what money we use as a society. Um, and, and that settlement layer, that is something that can and should be decentralized. And the infrastructure that's built on top of that or on the side of that, that can be a different story, case in point, Coinbase, um, or, and various other exchanges and payment mediums. And I'm sure Invictus and Revix also falls into that category um, of making those kind of products. So that, that's sort of our response. Is mm -hmm. It really depends on what layer you're looking at. And Louis? You? Well, I think I mean, I think, I think just give me one second so I can plug my laptop in here. Um, yeah, look, I think, I think if your question is more of a philosophical one, I mean, the technology, I don't know what audience your podcast is for, but um, I don't, I'm not going to explain it. But essentially, there, there are a lot of different technology providers that are aiming to make it holding or crypto more mainstream, right? And that's kind of half the battle right now. The philosophical point of owning your or being your own bank is great. Don't get me wrong, but it is is implausible right now for a lot of people. Um, from coming from a, a more institute, not an institutional, but from a from a technology, financial technology background, right? So in payments and those kind of things, just understanding the improvement that having a shared ledger, basing or a shared fabric of of ownership tracking for financial assets, right? So I'm talking about cryptocurrencies all the way through to any digital asset, like a share, like a derivative, any of those things. Right now, there are like six or seven layers storing these things. You've got custody providers at the bottom working through exchanges with uh, basically brokers, dealing with financial intermediaries, dealing with your financial planner who then has a dashboard and then sends you a PDF, right? 
there are like eight or nine layers. And even if you look at the classical financial space now, even a bank, right? So the bank only has like, let's put it this way, to hyper-simplified. A retail bank has a ledger with a number on it, which actually is only given credence by the fact that the reserve bank has a ledger that says that this bank has that money. Mm -hmm. So how many layers deep do, does the actual ownership of a digital asset go just to secure the ownership of that digital asset? So my argument with, with crypto really is, is you don't really have to be a guy who has your own like ledger and like stores it in your cupboard really to see the benefit on the entire industry that this is actually forming. Something like Revix, you basically could with one layer do everything that the whole financial system does currently, right? Um, obviously in certain cases, other cases not. So there will be improvements on that, on the half key recovery works and all those different things and maybe one day we'll get there. But right now we're cutting six or seven layers out of the storyline which I think is, is, you know, is good progress. Okay, cool. No, I like that. I, re I really do appreciate these answers. And I mean, w one thing, Jonty, that, that you said, which I do agree with, is around the, the staking um, of coins. And it's, it's one thing that being in a crypto fund, you can get the benefit of doing. You know, if, if I want to go and stake coin now for Dash, um, or even NEO, where it's, the barrier to entry is a little bit lower, just that whole process of trying to set up a coin to stake it and you know doing all that type of stuff, it's saying that these crypto funds can group all the money together, they can provide the collateral and they can get the benefit. And it reminds me of you know back two years ago when CryptoKitties first popped out, um, a, a group of us decided to, instead of us each buying our own CryptoKitty, we decided to give all the Ether to, to me, funnily enough, and I went and I bought all the crypto kitties. And the reason why we bought them all in one fund was that because by having them all in one fund, you could make the breeding opportunities better because the cats can't breed with their brothers. So the more cats you have, the more diversified you can have your, your little breeding thing. But of course, there was there's, a, there's another problem though that this uh, brings up. And that is, I could have taken all of these crypto kitties and run away with it. You know, I could have, once people have given me their crypto assets, I can disappear. And this was something that we kind of saw with a few of those scams uh, with ICOs and you know some of the stuff that happened. What what protection do investors have when they come to Invictus or when they come to Revex and they say, you know, here's my money, you're buying crypto, but how do I know that I can withdraw it at a later stage? So Louis, seeing that I have given yeah, seeing that I have put some money into Revex. Um, what, what, are, what are some of the guarantees that I will be able to pull it out at a future date? Uh, my you can't, you can't exit scam now. <laughs> you didn't have to set up a whole podcast to ask me about this. Hey? You, could have, <laughs> you, could have just, uh, you could have just asked me. Um, no, so that's an important point that you raised. I mean, like the, us, all the scams that basically occurred over the last two years are a case in point of, and I think what it, a case in point in, in these kind of things, I mean, the Ethereum chamber of, I think, 2016 being my favorite. Um, and that is the danger that everyone always uh, alludes to with centralized systems, right? Centralized point of control. Um, a lot of the response to that has been to try and do everything on chain. Um, so have it kind of, what I say, very auditable, um, kind of, let's say, decentralized in the sense that no one, no one party can actually do that right which is i think is a noble concept and i think it is is where everything is going eventually um at revex i mean we try and merge the classical financial world just from a usability standpoint with a lot of these new technologies right so i mean we have an investor subvest who's listed on a stock exchange um here locally and we're working on our next round at the moment which i mean stay tuned um but essentially a lot of a lot of the kind of trust that is required in a market like this. I mean, like the same thing with Alan Gray. I mean, why do you think Alan Gray is not going to leave the money? It's because, you know, there is a team behind it, they've got brand, they've got those kind of things, right? So what we're trying to really do is regardless of technology, because usually your BBC customers and the man on the street, I mean, are you going to go audit someone's smart contract? Or who are you going to trust that the smart contract is audited? Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these different things come down to trust at the end of the day and brand. Um, so we fully believe that the way that we actually prove the and audit are auditable with the asset kind of custody it will evolve over time. Um, but right now, what we really believe is important for mainstream adoption is really is playing the same game that the rest of the world plays when it comes to trust. 
an, an institutional trust, right? So, and that's one of the key things that is required in the next bit, in my opinion. So, to answer your question, uh, Michael, um, your money's gone. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, really. Yeah, he's, that's, he's, that's, he's, it's diversified. <laughs> <laughs> it's diversified, but then it was gone. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, no, I mean, that's just it. I mean, you have you have a JSE listed company with directors um, who, I mean, are held to some ridiculous standards when you've got publicized directors on our side with liability and we're looking into things like insurance at this point. So at the end of the day, we've got to, we've got to marry between usability um and obviously transparency and that's the kind of game that we're playing at this point and others will take different approaches and i think everyone will end i guess where they end and, and John, no, I mean, to, be, to, to be fair i mean it's it's perfect it's perfect um the two different approaches you're taking so you, you guys are onboarding um south african rand um directly into these uh these bundles as you call them basically the index product and um you so, so underlying that, you've actually got the, the, the cust, like you're saying, the seven layers built and the custody is audited uh, and, and is regulated essentially for South African investors, right? We are technically, yes. So, yeah, I mean, so, I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, mean, so I, mean we, no, I, exactly, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to you guys. I mean, the, the main difference, is, I, I would imagine, between our two platforms is that um, your guys' fund is smart contract um, run, as far as I understand. Yeah, our initial our initial fund was um, we we're in the process of setting up into well we have we have regulated constructs and Cayman Islands set up like US dollar fiat onboarding um, for accredited investors, but obviously our initial user base was retail investors from around the world, excluding mm-hmm. South Africa, Cayman, and US investors. So yes, obviously, we, sort of like on two different spectrums. So we're doing similar things, but actually it's two completely different directions, which is fine. I think. Both, both of them will end up needing to sort of merge toward, like you were saying, a situation where you've got those seven layers of the financial system. So you've got an easy user interface, you've got the custody solution, it's ideally uh, regulated and then therefore insured, which is what will bring in institutional money. Um, and it's, you sort of have to get all these things right. And it's not, it's not going to be very easy. I mean, insurance companies aren't offering fully insured, um, full insurance on digital assets. And the custody. I think, Bitco, right. I think Bitco have launched the fully insured product right now. I mean, even then the cost, I mean. Yeah, moment, exactly. And right. for something viable for fund managers. I mean, right now that's like for super high net worth individuals that just want to sort of like diversify. Like, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, exactly. I mean, like the thing is that I think that the key difference, I think what, what you were kind of alluding to, Michael, is, is the centralized almost ability to be scammed. You know, having a centralized part of the system that somebody could up and go, right? Um, at the end of the day, like the human, the human psyche requires trust anchors. At the end, mm. like as it is now, in my opinion. I mean, there are the, the fully decentralized models. I mean, I'm not quite sure if you guys are, are fully decentralized. I would imagine if you had a smart contract based on Ethereum, you would have to be tokenizing Bitcoin to actually store it in your smart contract, and that would be quite complicated. So I'm not quite sure how you guys do that at the end. Um, but there's always going to be some sort of man in the loop and like at the moment, right? Um, obviously, the end game is for, I mean, I've seen quite a few projects like token sets and things like that that really do great work on fully uh, decentralizing and automating the fund management process. And I know just before we started here, Michael, you were mentioning um, the team from the hackathon that were, what do you call them? Snap, that were doing yes. uh, auto rebalance, you know, Ethereum based fund. I mean, those things are all kind of the starting points of the fully decentralized version of what I think Crypto20 and Rebix are doing. I think we're just approaching it from different different customer bases and also just I mean, each system to its own is going to be different. But when the regulation does come in and we are really looking forward to being regulated I mean, it, it actually just brings a whole bunch of credence to the market, and it's really something that we're trying to preempt and trying to be in line with um, in all jurisdictions that we operate in. So, like I said, our, our view on the market is just that to be a very compliant, even pre-compliant, and kind of look around the corner and start building that trust from an institu- not institutional, but from a B2C brand, really, that we are not going anywhere. 
Okay, but perfect. Well, I, I was thinking, I was thinking maybe we can, you know, we can chat about, because I think this is maybe one of the, the big differences between your guys' two funds and what's actually like, I guess, the core of the conversation is the compositions of the assets that you hold. Yeah. Now, I know yeah. Invictus, you've got quite a lot of different offerings. So let's, I don't know, maybe we focus on Crypto20, because I think that's the one that most people know about. Um, but feel free to talk about the other ones. I just don't know that much about them. I know you've got Crypto10 as well now, and you've got something called Hy Hyperium. Hyper no, that's our venture capital fund. Yes, which is which is a little bit on, on a different side, but maybe... Yeah. yeah, so we can pop that for now. But I think mm -hmm. let's maybe talk about Crypto20, because I did go and look at the composition before this podcast started, and I see that you don't have an equally weighted... Um, allocation to each of the coins you've got I think ethereum is the your heaviest and I think ontology is your is your lightest um, now, now yeah can you maybe talk a little bit through about how that distribution is decided and then we're going to jump to Louis afterwards who's got an equally weighted um, index so yeah John T over to you sure no thanks so this this sort of brings in a topic I should have brought from the beginning is our specialization is um, our team has come from a background strongly in data science. Um, hence, we talked about data profit a company that Daniel Schwartz co-founded back in, I think it was 2014. And um, effectively, that, that background allowed us to build um, the methodology behind the rebalancing as well as the composition. So the, the composition is... Um, as, as, you, as you pointed out, market cap weighted uh, with an asset cap of, um, I believe it's, it, it, in, in theory, it's, it's supposed to be 10% per asset uh, for the most part, except for obviously the value of um, Ether is skyrocketed. So we were holding less than 10% and then it skyrocketed and goes 12%, right, of the, of, the, of the total holdings relatively. Now, what that means is, is that w where do those numbers come from? Well, if you read the white paper, um, that we put out at the end of 2017 that, that acted as our white paper for the ICO um, to seed the fund. The idea behind that was we, we, we used a variety of um, back testing on different types of methodologies to work out what makes sense from a fund construct perspective. So really where, where Invictus comes from is for the retail investors in terms of, of what they can get exposure to and how easy it is for them to get exposure to things. We wanted to give them the most sophisticated, fun construct um, without necessarily, you know, having having all the, the mechanisms necessary so then, you know, we can onboard U.S. investors with fiat, right? So, yes, they, they, they can buy and buy a smart contract, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera. Um, so that, that's sort of where the background comes in. So that's actually dynamically um, rebalanced on a weekly basis, right? So what I'll do is, uh, you, you, you know, for reference, um, anyone can actually go to the the performance page, so you can actually see uh, uh, what the what the live figures are, um, and then obviously when it gets rebalanced, those numbers change based on what our our uh, rebalance algorithm determines. It's a rules based strategy. It determines what what makes the most sense to rebalance into. Now, obviously, when you're rebalancing weekly, like we do. You can run into liquidity and slippage issues. We also built um, uh, algorithms to in, to minimize slippage in terms of like we can actually input. Uh, we, we, when we do those rebalancing ourselves, we make sure that uh, we minimize the slippage based on um, the different orders we're placing, and that's based on a rules based strategy also, right? So we we built all that on the data science piece. Now I'm not a data scientist, so I can only throw around buzzwords, but I can just speak to sort of if you want to go into the more depth about it. You can take a look at our white paper that's publicly available uh, on the on the website. Um, and then the other similar fund, Crypto10 Hedged, which we just launched, uh, similar idea. Now that the market has sort of changed, we've actually updated those figures. Now we have an asset cap of 15% in Crypto10, um, still weekly rebalancing, and um, also a uh, dynamic cash hedge. So it actually allocates into cash um, according to different timings and markets, um, most importantly is to protect investors from downside risk. So we, where we specializing is the actual underlying fund construct um, and where we, where we sort of um, made, made sure it was like you know, affordable for investors is cut costs using smart contracts 
technology and obviously make sure you know it's, it's at least audited so, so we have a kpmg audit for crypto 20 um on the operations because we do self-custody so that obviously brings down the cost but then obviously for the retail investor they had to put a lot of trust in us as you correctly mentioned earlier louis mentioned so you, it's not completely decentralized of course not like we basically have our reputations on the line it's fund managers built up like a track record of 18 months now but long story short the data science piece is where we specialize and sort of put our name behind in terms of the back testing and, and the results we've gotten thus far. Okay, perfect. With, with those technologies. Cool. And, and Louis, did you also use back testing with, with yours or, or how did you come up with, with your offerings? <clears throat> yeah, I think we, we took an altogether different approach, right? Um, I think if we, if we just take a step back and actually just have a look at the kind of customer bases that I reckon uh, the respective projects are trying to open. I mean, um, there is, if you look at the space of crypto right now, like, um, I mean, there's so many points. Um, the actual, like the correlation between the assets is, I mean, everybody knows is quite high. Um, so already when you're looking at why you would diversify in crypto, you're looking at of what we believe is actually just mitigating your downside risk on an individual asset, something going wrong. In the nascent industry, that's really one of the biggest value points. I mean, if we take a look at the performance of Ethereum, um, just with, I would say, the project-based risk and how they've been handling it over the last bit, I mean, the performance of Ethereum, I'd, I'd like to you for the exact numbers, but has performed worse than Bitcoin over the last six months by probably two or three times. Um, and that's just something that, I mean, are there actual like people out there running these projects who have different, you know, are doing well or not doing well, the same way that you would have a stock exchange doing the same thing. So we kind of see the main benefit of diversification in such a nascent market is more of protecting people's assets from something like a sign-off occurring and you being in the wrong one than really maximizing your performance, right? So that's kind of one of our main views on this in such an early market. At the end of the day, the asset class has such asymmetric return potential, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you actually look at the use cases that it could be used in, eventually you're looking at um, massive growth possibilities. Obviously, there is the risk of the whole asset class ends at naught, um, which I think everybody in the room probably doesn't think, um, but there are people out there that say that. Um, and the real battle that we've identified is really opening up the opportunities from, of people because, I mean, crypto is probably used by less than 1%, like, let's be honest, like, it's tiny, right? The the market cap of crypto is tiny compared to the entire financial market. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick stat on, on just how small the market cap is. So I think it's currently standing at $177 billion, which we yeah. think sounds like a lot. But you look, there was that oil company in Saudi Arabia who, it was yeah, this month, earlier this Ramco. month. Yeah. Uh, they said, you know, we want to raise raise some money on bonds, and they got orders of a hundred billion dollars in orders. You know, and look, they just wanted ten billion, but a hundred billion dollars popped up like that, and like casual. Yeah. yeah, casually pops up, and that's more than fifty percent of the entire crypto, um, you know, yeah. market cap. So no, it's, so, I mean, that's the reason why I'm kind of saying, like, let's take a step back. Like, we are not actually, we're not actually that. I mean, we've got an equally weighted strategy on, on all of our bundles. We've kind of gone more for a thematic narrative base where we take themes in the crypto market, so payments, um, privacy, and platform, and then our top 10, which is essentially very easy to understand. The real battle here, in our opinion, like actually looking, I mean, Sabres being from the classical financial market side, most of the people we interact with being from that side, the real battle here is actually just trust and understanding from the classical financial market on a tech stack that is more efficient at storing and trading and I guess custodying all of these different assets, right? That's a real battle we're playing. So for us, you know, the strategy of exactly how the assets are weighted in a market that either is going to grow by 10,000 times or disappear um, is not really the main concern. But now I want to talk to you about, you've got the different bundles because this is one thing that I don't know, confused me a bit when I went to go and, you know, put my money in, in on Revex is That's one right. of the whole things is, you know, you're going up to one of these bundles, like let's say Crypto20. Crypto20 is like, I don't know which coin to buy. Here, Crypto20, take my money. They can deal with it. But I come to Revex and I see you've got the payment bundle, you've got the platform bundle, you've got the 
top something bundle and you've got the privacy bundle. Um, doesn't that go against the whole idea of simplicity? People coming here and they're almost like, I want to be in crypto, take my money, invest it for me. Whereas now I'm coming to your thing and I'm like, oh, which one do I do? I mean, I eventually just put a quarter of all my money in all four. You know, that's how, because I don't know which one to choose. Baby. I really didn't know which <laughs> one to choose. Uh, I mean, that's good product feedback. Thanks. I mean, like, like I said, I mean, we, we launched to, we've been on beta test for quite a while. We launched the public with our offering probably only two weeks ago. We've had some great feedback, but you're right. I mean, at, at this point, we were engaging with, I wouldn't say institutional investors. I would say the classical financial hierarchy of your financial planners all the way through to your like discretionary fund managers, all of those kind of side, kind of shopping around like what, what is of interest. But at the end of the day, what Revit really represents and where we're going over the near future is essentially a direct indexing platform. Um, basically going all in on the fact that assets and currencies and derivatives and bonds and all these different wonderful things are more efficiently stored on blockchain rails than they are in the existing world. Um, so as, as regulation catches up and as, I mean, kind of appetite for these types of products move forward, we'll be launching more and more, I would say, either themed bundles, um, moving into space, possibly overlapping on Hyperion Fund. We've got some plans over there, but more in the classical VC space, um, looking into alternative assets through kind of credit swaps, looking through all of these different, how would I say, uh, Things that would normally, I mean, there's a couple of interesting projects we've got on the way, so I'm not actually going to get too deep into them. But at the end of the day, what we are really after here is uh, product feedback, thank you. <laughs> and, and lastly, essentially just um, a kind of a new age of investing, let's put it that way. A way that we can get individuals at a B2C level to get cut down three or four of the layers between them and actually the cold face of investing. And in that way, lower cost over time. Okay. And now, I um, just want to come back to, to John T. Uh, you mentioned something about backtesting. And like I was telling Louis earlier, you know, I went to this Ethereum hackathon and there was a team that built you know, a rebalancing portfolio. And one of the things they did was they did some really cool backtesting. And they said, look, you know, when you apply the strategy on historical information, look how profitable it was going to be. Um, and I know data scientists love backtesting, but from my background as an actuary, you know, we've always been warned against backtesting and technical analysis and all that type of stuff. So I did go and I, and I got a quote from a guy who's a professor at, at MIT, uh, Andrew Lowe, he said this you know, two years ago um, in Bloomberg Business Week. And he said the following, just because he says it much more elegantly than I could. He says, the more you search over the past, the more likely it is you're going to find exotic patterns that you happen to like or focus on. But these patterns are least likely to repeat. And I guess it's, it's something that we see in the traditional financial markets is fund managers always have to say to potential investors, you know, past, perform, uh, past performance is not an indicator of future performance. And it's one of the things that backtesting relies on is that the future will replicate the past. Um, and I mean, there's, there's a lot of other ways that, you know, we, we look at backtesting, you know, there's the way you can cherry pick it over certain time periods and all this other type of stuff. Is, is that something that, you know, Invictus considers? Um, like, do you also consider some of the fundamentals uh, around some of the cryptos? Or is it a purely backtested um, strategy that you guys go for. Oh, John T, we have, yeah, we lost your audio there for a bit. Sorry. That's, that's, that's an excellent question because I guess that's one of the fallacy or well, classic fallacies behind any kind of data driven approach. Um, it's a sort of like overanalyze, um, uh, you know, using only a regression analysis and using you know, historical backtesting as a, as a way to rationalize your strategy. I, I think I think a backtested strategy to to represent what 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 the work you've done behind an algorithm can do just based on previous like history is just a way to represent something that hasn't been launched yet. So I mean, unfortunately, you have to do that. Uh, the nice thing with Crypto Twenty is now it's got what about eighteen months. If you go on Coin Market Cap and go C Twenty, you can actually see the. The actual coins performance, and if you're on crypto20.com, you can see the underlying net asset value of the token. 
Um, so it sort of operates like a tokenized ETF, if you will, because mm -hmm. it's traded on an exchange, tokenized exchange traded product, right? Um, so the what, what I would say is th there's a couple of things you do on the dynamic side of things with like the weekly rebalancing. Um, that's why it's, it, you know, we do a combination of, number one, we, when we weekly rebalance, we do actually take some active decisions. Um, in the case, like I mentioned, uh, I think I did mention, I'm sure I did, but we chose to exclude BitConnect um, just because it was a blatant scam. Um, so we don't just like blindly follow the, 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 the market. Um, in some cases where we're not sure as a new coin enters the top 20 or top 10, depending on the fund, um, if it makes sense, there's the various things we take into consideration on a qualitative basis, whether or not we actually include a coin. Um, you know, Tezos was, a, was, a, was, was one that we took a, a, lot, a long time to make a decision on, um, as well as um, when a coin falls out. I, I'm not going to go into the specifics of that, but basically it's a qualitative as well as a quantitative. I think the most important thing, though, is you're giving diversified exposure to the upside in crypto, um, while by in some means, way, shape, or form, like protecting risk from down, uh, protecting investors from downside risk, right? And what we've done is, so if Crypto Twenty was initially giving people exposure to the upside, the staking, the the masternodes, um, you know, <laughs> then most people don't bother like with like voting on EOS and, and like the block votes and things like that, right? So we took care of all of that. So that was like the product mission. Now what we're shifting toward is doing exposure to the upside in terms of a, a dynamically rebalanced strategy on a week-by-week -week basis, plus a dynamic cash hedge to allocate into cash at times the market streets, right? And the idea there is, first of all, the back test on that looks amazing. I'm not, I'm not going to quote that answer. You know, it's on the website and all that. But the point is, is that it's, 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 we take into account that rare events can happen. Um, we also have been exploring uh, making use of options for rare events that cannot be predicted, like we saw in the last couple of months when someone bought, uh, what was it, like $100 million worth of Bitcoin on an exchange, something like that, correct me if I'm wrong. But the point is, is that you can take those into account. I think the single most important thing that um, we, we still, still fail to mention is Bitcoin has done a 10 million X. Am I, am I right? A million to 10 million X? In the space of ten years, right? Since since inception, I think what is like a, a thousandth of a, do, a, a dollar in the issue, so it's like zero mm -hmm. point one cent US dollar, and now it, it, you know it reached a peak of eighteen and, and drew down. Now the point is, is like you know all these sophisticated fund managers out there, how, how did they miss that, right? So our our decision with the index fund is, I'll say, let's not make that same mistake again. Um, if Bitcoin, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, um, and it's a fifteen percent cap. You're going to get your, your your amazing gains if Bitcoin turns out to be the global reserve currency, um, plus you know all the benefits of some other crypto assets and blockchains that come like these massive platforms. And I agree, I think it's quite cool to have um, platform bundles and um, potentially privacy bundles like we're doing at Relix, right? I think the problem is we don't yet know if a, one or two, if not just one blockchain and one one cryptocurrency, just sort of absorbs the entire markets. Cap, right? I mean, that's that's something that's still up for debate. But uh, obviously, we towards like not necessarily uh, maximalism, but these are the things you've got to take into account that backtesting simply can't do, right? Mm -hmm. Backtesting didn't predict Bitcoin. Backtesting pretty much didn't predict Ethereum, um, and backtesting won't predict massive downfalls and, and these kind of things. What you have to do is you have to take some kind of uh, a combination of a traditional data-driven and some kind of sophisticated like approach, not just like sort of a back test approach. I mean, that's, cool. that's a straightforward answer. Because right? this, this was the thing. So I, I was speaking to the guy at the hackathon and I said to, you know, asked him this exact, or, or what I said to him, uh, and it alludes to your whole thing about how one coin can become dominant. And I said to him, I said, the one thing that these rebalancing funds do is they sell the winners and they buy the losers. You know, if, let's say Ethereum's doing really well, like you say, it holds more than 10%. In your rebalancing, you're going to have to offload Ethereum um, and you're going to have to keep offloading it the better it does. And when I told him this, you know, you're selling your winners and you're buying your losers, his answer to me was, oh, but the backtesting has shown that this has been, you know, the, the better strategy. So that's, that's kind of, which I did not like that as an answer. But I want to, I want to come to something else that, that you spoke about. And, and Louis Sean actually emailed me about this as well. And it has been something quite big in the crypto space. 
Um, and I just want to ask your guys' opinions on, on, the three, on three following coins and to see whether you include it or you don't include it. And those coins are, are Ripple, um, Tether, and Bitcoin Satoshi Vision. Now, Louis, I know Revix has dropped Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, and it's been a complete, you know, chaos in, in the market. Um, but I want to talk about, yeah, maybe Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, where the owner of a currency does something crazy, but also something like Tether, where I see, I don't think you guys include Tether, which I'm quite surprised by, is I know it represents the dollar, but it's still a cryptocurrency. And then, of course, Ripple is another interesting one because, in my opinion, and I know I, I do get a little bit of hate for this, I don't consider crypto as a cryptocurrency. You know, it's, it's centralized, there's no mining, there's, you know, it's like coins can just be minted and destroyed at will, and it's, I don't understand it. Um, mm. But I see that that is a coin that you guys do hold. So that's why, talk, talk, talk me through why you're holding Ripple, why you're not holding Tether, what makes you decide whether a token, and, and you're talking about another one, Tezos, what makes a coin um, not worthy of being part of your index funds? Interesting. Okay, cool. So, as you know, uh, we, we kind of removed SV, which from our perspective is less, I mean, we're not, we don't really play in the discretionary space, right? I mean, we've got a very clear rules-based um, kind of, I would say, outline as to how we actually manage our funds. And essentially, we, we base our decisions on a few trust anchors like Binance, um, like Coinbase, all these all kind of leaders in the market, right? And like I said, our customer base is slightly different to your normal crypto evangelist, right? Our customer base is someone who has a look at the market and sees somebody acting real fishy that would probably get investigated if you were a director of a public company um, and says, like, why are we holding that kind of a thing, right? Mm -hmm. So from our perspective, it, it was an easy move to kind of remove SV. Um, I think the answer for XRP or Ripple is, I think, down to the point of why we diversify like this. A lot of people have varying views on what XRP will do over the future, whether it is or is not a cryptocurrency, right? But at the end of the day, the reason why we diversify, and it comes also to your point, is why you're, you're continuously offloading the winners in a, in a rebalancing strategy, which does well for a trending market and never really predict a skyrocket of an asset. But if you look at XRP, it, it has a divide, two schools of thought, right? Us having it in our, our bundle essentially represents the future of where half of the world is right about it and the other half is wrong. So for us, that's the main key point of why we're diversifying across the 10, top 10 assets in our top 10 and in our payment bundle. I mean, at the end of the day, it could do well, it could not do well, but right now, assuming is basically guessing, and guessing right now from a, from a passive investment standpoint is not really what our client base wants to do. Um, and then Tether, I mean, it's really simple. I mean, if it's meant to track the dollar, a lot of our clients essentially could just own dollar. Um, so it would basically just be a dampener. It would be a, a currency hedge. Um, I don't know, as far as I understand, you guys are doing something like that. But essentially, it would be like holding dollar in our fund, which would not really be indicative of the asset class in general. It would just one tenth of our, our asset class would basically just be dampened to the dollar, which would mean nothing really if we were actually tracking our fund performance in dollar. So that's kind of why we've excluded any stable points. Okay. And Jonty, okay. you perfect. Mm -hmm. And Jonty, your your views? <laughs> Well, yeah, I can, I can. Let me start with more simpler ones before we get to the <laughs> um, Yeah, similar idea with excluding tether. Um, it, you know, it, 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 on one hand, obviously, it's, it's kind of pointless. Um, on the other hand, obviously, the, 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 the work at the time when we launched Crypto Twenty, there was still like some question marks around it. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, as, as, a, as, a, as a fund where people could liquid, so, so the point of Crypto20 was people can liquidate via a smart contract very quickly um, via our, um, our D app on Crypto20.com, right? And uh, they can also trade the token on the exchange, similar to like an ETF, I suppose. And then in that case, it, it's very easy for them to just exit the fund themselves. Uh, so in a similar way, if people wanted to diversify using Tether, it doesn't really make sense. Especially remember, there's an opportunity cost 
for every coin you're holding or the token you're holding in an exchange, uh, sorry, in a, <laughs> in, a in custody, um, in terms of obviously there's a cost to store that, um, especially in the case like Rubik's, you know, guys using, um, uh, you know, bank rate, get, get bank rate security on, on certain aspects of your custody. Um, similar to the thing with our kind of self, uh, certain aspects of our self, self custody. But the point is, is that there's an opportunity cost there. So you, at, at the end of the day, if you're going to say you're going to make a cryptocurrency fund, um, I think there's two things. You don't be dogmatic about it. Um, so in the case of Ripple, I mean, yeah, we, we all have different views about it and viewpoints and haters and sort of like, well, it's given great, great gains and all that. But I think yeah, the point is for the purpose of Crypto20, um, it made it made sense to include Ripple again, uh, based on the back testing, based on the performance thus far. Didn't make sense to include Tether for aforementioned reason. Um, Bitcoin SV um, obviously gets a bit tricky. One of the other things which I didn't mention, which obviously makes is, is the same for Rivix, is some of these crypto assets from time to time decide to do a fork, and now you've got a new crypto asset. Um, in the case between Cash and. 2017, and now Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin ABC, etc., etc., and add infinitum, right? Um, obviously, a lot of those are going to end up being worthless, but some of them aren't. Um, in the case of Bitcoin SV, um, sort of like pretty becoming pretty complicated because it's obviously like uh, again different views, sort of have this centralized figurehead that's causing all kinds of issues. Um, various exchanges have made very very clear opinions about you know uh, their opinion of Bitcoin SV by delisting it. Uh, but the fact of the matter, matter remains is that we got those crypto assets in our fund, and you know, so you but surely we, we will either diversify out of or into it based on you know, our, our mandate, our fund mandate, our underlying fund mandate was we're going to do X with forks. Um, you know, it is it's basically income initially, um, and then after a long period of time, it sort of becomes um, it sort of disperses the value it's across the fund. Yeah, you know, exactly a disbursement. So. You know, those are sort of complex things. I think the more interesting thing is, number one, avoiding scams um, and then being aware of uh, regulatory concerns. So I think there were a lot of regulatory concerns around Tezos. Um, I think there were obvious concerns around BitConnect and these sort of things that, like, you know, just any sort of half-witted fund manager can, can make a decision about. And you can sort of say, this is in line of a fund mandate, this isn't. Um, then, yeah, off, after that, if you want to do more complex things, um, then... You've got to be careful. Once you once you're managing over like ten to forty million dollars, you got to you got to really stick to your fund mandate, right? I think after that, then just create a new fund. Say, look, this is the X fund, the the sort of like shitcoin fund, excuse my French or whatever. We're going to literally invest in these things, and if, if you want, you can invest in that. But this is the top twenty or the top ten or the platform bundle or the privacy coin bundle or the the, the, the top ten bundle. And this is what this is going to do. You stick to that as a professional fund manager, right? Um, but obviously, sometimes you make exceptions if you're not, you don't sit at and dogmatic. Because, because I mean, this, this is the thing is, as this space evolves, I mean, especially we're looking at, you know, JP Morgan coin and, and other <laughs> institutions, you know, could, could start bringing things that are these centralized blockchains, which I kind of feel is like <laughs> the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of why I am a little bit like against Ripple because I see Ripple's perfect use cases for it to become a stable coin, and you know, JP Morgan is almost coming in on, on all that type of stuff. <laughs> but but again, this is where it does get a little bit you know con uh, confusing. Is what coins you do you include and what coins don't you include? And that's why I like, I like what you said because it's, it's a good actuarial uh, term. You know, stick to your mandate. You know, whatever your mandate was, stick to that. Um, but I must say, you have given me quite a good idea. I mean, if you created a shitcoin fund, it would be interesting, <laughs> you know, with, with all the currencies that, yeah, you know... Basically, you could just go on Telegram for those. I mean, there's a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like Discord, Discord pump and grunt, dump groups, and <laughs> got some shitcoin funds. You would just invest in them if it, if it went onto the Telegram channel and, and saw, like, yeah. a scam factor of over 100. And then just, just pump money. <laughs> pump no, one, one serious thing, sorry. I had to cut in here, and this is actually just recognized. Um, Louis, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, you literally spoke about this topic at, um, I think it was like a, P a PWC event in, um, in Cape Town with regard to yeah. sort of like these corporations that try to sort of like take blockchain and cut yeah. it into this corporate hole, which is we like blockchain, but we kind of want to have like this permission part and like well, we want, you know, you know what I mean? 
So you can actually speak to this. I think it's an important topic. Yeah, I think I, I think I had a bad day that day, but I, I, kind of, <laughs> I remember it at least. So I remember you. <laughs> what I was trying to say is like a raving lunatic. <laughs> um, no, exactly. I mean, like I always find it quite quizzical when you hear a bank making a comment about blockchain, saying or, or any type of public-based cryptocurrency, or I would say, quote unquote, as Michael would say, be your own bank. And say like oh, we don't really see a use case for this, right? And if you think about it, like a lot, like a bank is basically just this massive castle that they built in cybersecurity, right? Protecting basically a sheet of paper that says that John T has this much money and Lee has this much money, right? All of that security is duplicated across every single bank, and there's like probably a hundred thousand banks of decent size, about the size of NetBank or perhaps or whatnot around the world. All of them duplicate the security just to protect the underlying ledger and the integrity of what we call our financial system, right? Which is essentially a patched together hatchet job of tracking who has what money. And there are different ways in which people who are preordained, right? Like these are MasterCard and all these people way back in the day run these monopolies of who can actually trade or, or actually transact money between each other, right? And like if you really look at the, the cost of tracking this money and the cost of moving this money, obviously there's benefits like oversight from central banks, there's anti-money laundering, there's all these other things like granted. None of that is exclusive from the crypto side, right? But if you look at the investment to open a bank, you're looking a couple, you know, maybe a couple of hundred million just in technology and security and regulation and all of that. All of the main risk is somebody tampering and creating money and then that money moving to another bank, in which case the link is then lost because the banks need to trust each other that nobody's creating fake money, right? So now if you actually think about replacing all of that extra hard work with a fabric, a shared fabric of ownership, right? Where the whole world can trans can actually donate or not donate, but contribute a little bit to the actual integrity of the shared ledger, you're looking at an overall saving of in, like in, an unfathomable amount of money. Uh, from a financial institution layer. So that's why like, I, I almost have no doubt that over the next 10 to 20 years, we will eventually reach a point where challenger banks empowered by blockchain or financial institutions or derivative platforms or Revexes and crypto 20s and that get to the point where based on the groundswell of technology and, and how would I say open source IP and all of that, you end up competing directly with a bank with three guys. You know, mm -hmm. and you're seeing that happen already with challenger banks overseas, just with slick technology. Then you're seeing, okay, they still have to get regulated. Now you're seeing regulatory arbitrage with people being able to provide financial services um, across the world through different like jurisdictions. So, I mean, that's why I always look at these like enterprise blockchains and they say, yeah, like, no, it'll totally work for us between us and our correspondent bank. And you're just like, well, you're missing half the point, but there's no way you can see it from that, from that viewpoint. You have to almost be outside the bank to look at this big castle thinking like you don't need it, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. sorry for the rant, but it's something no, that I will... I think it's an important rant. This, this, <laughs> it was a good talk also, as so I obviously remembered it. It's, it's really great that you gave it. But I think the important thing is, you're right, they, they, they missed the point. And I think, and this this is taken from an excellent podcast um, that uh, Antoliano Pomp did with um, Alex Kuczynski, the CEO and co-founder of Celsius, um, with regards to sort of the world being reinvented in the form of like decentralized platforms and specifically decentralized monopolies, whereby these monopolies just, the, the, the decentralized platforms are simply more efficient, effectively more trustworthy because they're trustless and um, yeah, and more efficient and will just sort of outcompete these centralized solutions, whatever sort of, sort of like hybrid or zombie blockchain form they take. Mm -hmm. And what, what will end up happening is they'll actually become monopolies, but they're decentralized. So the hope would be is that they still act in the best interests of the coin holders or wallet holders or users, um, which could just simply shift to another blockchain if that one no longer becomes uh, working in the best interest of the users. The problem is right now is the banks, that doesn't work with the banks. The banks serve, you know, the 1% classically. Um, the, a lot of the unbanked will never be served by those kind of services. Yet they probably will be served by decentralized platforms because again they're more efficient, um, and therefore those why those decentralized platforms will end up becoming probably monopolies themselves. But hopefully again this will be a good thing um, 
as is often said. But uh, yeah, and, and that's and look, that goes to that's why you should have an index philosophy is because we don't know where these things. Are. No one predicted Bitcoin in the way that it happened, except for a very lucky few. Um, and very few people will probably predict the next thing that that, that takes the way, shape, and form is Bitcoin. You know, everything only ever really happens once um, in history, so to speak. Mm. So well, I guess if you ask the art, no, let, let's focus on what's not competitive between us. I think what we both agree on is whether equally weighted or market cap weighted is obviously like we we want to catch those winners as they enter the market. Yeah, I mean, even I mean, to Michael's point, even if you're unloading a little bit of your mass of winners every now and then. You're also, you know, at the end of the day, you are, it works well in a trending strategy over time. You know, I mean, backtesting for one thing, I mean, at Revix, like our backtesting, we're not overtraining our backtesting. I mean, we have a very, very simple strategy. We're not, we're not learning off the backtesting and we're not overtraining, I guess, put it that way. Um, so in that case, I think we are all aligned. I was just going to make a comment just on decentralized monopoly. Like maybe in fuck seventy or eighty years, we're all sitting here, like, or somebody else is sitting here talking about some way in which we're going to overthrow the decentralized monopoly, or like we're going to be like self-sentient, like blockchains with everybody's money that are like, are like controlled by like a couple few people who manage to. I don't know. You never know, man. It's just interesting. <laughs> the whole game. I just love. It. I just addicted to the kind of. Um, it's enthralling. I mean, like it's a storyline, a narrative of its own, like the classical financial space, how it's set up, it's built patches on patches on patches, um, brand new asset class, who knows what will happen. I mean, this is the storyline investing has played on. I mean, it is the premise of all VC. It is the premise of basically all investing, right? So at the end of the day, both of our companies just attempt to make the increase of value accessible to different people. And that's literally the whole story in a nutshell. Exactly how we go about it, the technology, all of those things, people get really stuck in in who's doing what and how and when and those kind of things. But like Michael, you said, I mean, the market is less than like, almost like what? It, up until about a week ago, it was less than the estimated net income of Saudi Aramco yeah. for one year. <laughs> so like... Let's just be real. Like, there's a lot of unearthing to do from a from a uh, getting uh, legitimacy of an asset class, bringing users to an asset class, bringing investment companies to an asset class as an actual investment product. I know you're trying to stop me so that you can say goodbye before we run out of one minute. No, no, no. So yeah, so we. I do. I do have just two last questions to ask you guys. So can we do that that annoying thing again? Just click end meeting, sign back in. All right. I've got two last questions, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, basically, just two last questions, and then yeah, we can have some closing remarks and and end of this this really great discussion. Sure. Um, the first one is about the diversification benefits of crypto funds, and then the other one is a little bit about the operational complexity and some of the risks around them. Um, so I don't know if we should maybe start with the diversification one. Um, and the reason why I want to ask this is because in traditional finance, we tend to buy into an index fund because it offers diversification benefits. Um, with crypto, and it's something that we saw specifically at the end of 2017, is when Bitcoin went all the way down, all the coins followed with it. And we seem to see this, I guess, in most times in recessions, whenever there's an incredibly uh, you know, bad shock, the correlation benefits disappear, and we see everything moving together just when we need them to move differently. So is diversification a big benefit or, or one of the big things that you push forward um, with your crypto funds? Or is it something that you guys say, you know what, we're actually not seeing those benefits. Um, you know, it's not, it's not less risky to hold a crypto 20 fund than it is to say hold a single coin. Um, I don't know if you guys want to just yeah, talk about that. Mm -hmm. Look, I think it's, I think, I mean, you make a good point, right? The crypto market is highly correlated, but I think that you have to make a, a distinction between the reasons people diversify in an existing stock market and the reasons why diversification would work in such a nascent industry like the crypto space, right? In the existing financial market, like let's say the S&P 500 or any tracking fund like the charts that are standing further or whatnot, I mean, you're not really expecting one of those companies to go to zero. You're also not expecting some of those companies to 
be, I mean, I mean, there are scandals that come out all the time, but the, the inherent downside risk in those companies with the amount of regulation that is actually applied to them is actually quite low. So, and because the space is so well developed, people are looking for basis points, better return with large, large, large amounts of money. Um, knowing that overall the US stocks or bonds or things like that will, will differ per asset class over time. But the reason why you're diversifying is largely, I would say, slightly different. In the crypto space, the diversification benefits slightly shift more to risk mitigation when it comes to certain assets and taking a nose dive. Um, certain asset taking a nose dive being delisted, as you saw Bitcoin SV going almost like you know, having a bit of a dip. Um, something like Ethereum over time that struggles to implement the certain things or takes a bit longer or a competitor comes up quite rapidly over a year and actually displaces it. Um, all of those things are, are very, very fast moving. And from a diversification standpoint, regardless of, of correlation between good like assets when they're performing well, you are going to get dropouts over time. And I mean, we can note quite a few of them over. So I think we're seeing, I mean, a Bitcoin Cash SV for us was a, a great example of the value that a diversified portfolio would actually bring. Um, the removal of that asset into other assets, um, if it starts dropping, essentially is the point of what we're doing. A lot of people don't really want to be focusing on this full time, right? They want this thing to kind of operate on its own. And the correlation of the asset class together to work if the whole asset class performs well. Um, that's kind of how we see slight risk decrease on the large, you know? Okay. Okay. And and John T, anything to, to add on, on your side or shall we move to the, the final? No, there's, there, I think there's two really big points. The, the first thing which, like, if let, let's distinguish diversification into crypto for someone who hasn't actually died, like bought it at all, um, which I think we both agree and pretty much every fund manager has created their own form of showing that it makes sense to diversify into crypto. Um, you know, we, we wrote our own article related to, uh, to the top 10 crypto assets and we've, we've, we, 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 everyone sort of pitches that. And I think that's really important. It's something we forget as people in crypto is that it, it made so much sense to invest in crypto in the last 10 years, right? Um, and in some ways, it still makes sense to diversify into it. Now, the quick, the key question is how do you convince people to get off zero? Um, again, I took this from another great and Anthony Pompiano um, podcast, you should like start paying us. But um, that was with um, the, the really famous one he did, the Murad um, Maharadov um, podcast, uh, the ultimate Bitcoin argument. And then one question was like, or one discussion point was like, how do you get these fund managers off zero, that they have zero exposure to crypto? And the answer is any exposure, any sort of slight diversification into crypto yielded um, a, a, a better efficient frontier in their, in their portfolio performance and, and better sharp ratios, right? And um, now within crypto, the actual quantitative thing, Louis covered it all, right? Yes, Bitcoin's highly correlated. Uh, oh, sorry, all crypto assets are highly correlated with Bitcoin performance. The key thing is that crypto assets as a whole are decorrelated with other financial instruments, which is very unusual behavior. It's very unique. And one of the key questions we ask ourselves is will that hold in a financial crisis? You know, like where, where the US dollar really um, suffers and we have like the inflation and um, another financial crisis like in 2008. And that'll be interesting. Does it hold? Does it, uh, do people diversify into crypto then? Uh, and then the question is, how do you convince them? And I think it becomes a qualitative thing to have an index fund. It's intuitive. People are familiar with it. Um, this is the kind of thing we try to do. We try to make our products mimic the traditional financial world, similar to Rubix. And it makes sense, you know having those things in place so then these fund managers say, listen, we want to invest in this stuff, but like we want the wrappers and things around and make as much sense as possible. And they're used to things like index products. They're used to things like custody solutions. They, they, they're used to things like um, ETFs and these kind of things, which we working towards also. So yeah, long story short, I really think it's how you're approaching it. And the last thing is right now, the crypto markets, yes, everything's correlated to Bitcoin, but only for now. Right. Um, uh, it's, it's again, how long is that going to hold? When does that change? And when it changes, how big is that impact? Um, you know, these are the kind of things you have to take into account, these sort of rare events, which make having an index fund that makes sense, even if you're a maximalist. I mean, even okay. if you're a maximalist, 
Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever becomes the global reserve currency, you're going to make a lot of money just because you're in crypto to begin with. Okay, no, cool. Yeah. I like that. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I was just going to say, coming up to, I guess, yeah, the, the final question, because I, I think I've kept you guys here for long enough. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, the night is still young, so if you guys want to need, need to go out and, and enjoy Cape Town or Louis, you in London. Um, but John, the, the, the final question, Sorry, baby. The, the final question comes, I guess, yeah, this is very much an actuarial question, and it was one that I was able to ask uh, Vitalik while he was here at, at ETH Cape Town. Um, of course, you, you talk to Vitalik via tweets, not through, uh, you know, speech. And, and the, the question I asked him was, what is the biggest risk that he sees for Ethereum, and how does he deal with it? And his answer was that we don't develop the platform fast enough, and how he dealt with it was when he was not talking on the stage, um, he was on his laptop like almost 24-7 during the hackathon, you know, doing his whole thing. So my question to you two is, what is your, what is your greatest risk around your, your funds? And, you know, how do you, how do you go about managing them? And they don't necessarily have to be a market risk. I mean, it could very well be like an operational risk, like maybe... I don't know, you have nightmares of, of one employee coming in and sending all the coins to their personal wallet, getting on a yacht and, you know, jumping out the country with, with a lot of cash. Um, but Joe, what, what would you say are your, your crypto fund's biggest risks and how do you manage them? And then, yeah, I think we'll, we'll end on, on that question. So I don't know who wants to start and yeah, who wants to conclude? John, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I will... I'll sort of go with the contrarian answer, which is, I think, and look, again, I should have said this at the beginning, all my views don't necessarily represent those of Invictus, etc., etc. So it's too late. So it's like, yeah, it's too late. It's too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think one of the biggest risks in the is not having enough money in crypto for the next boom. And sort of the really ultimate one, I mean, the, the one where Bitcoin or equivalent really start shifting towards being the global store of value where it's beating gold, it's beating all precious metals, and eventually beating multiple serious fiat currencies. We've already beaten two, beaten the Zimbabwean dollar, and we've beaten the, what, what, what's, what's in Venezuela again? It's like it's Venezuela. Peso, so, I think, yeah. In terms of volatility, right? So yeah, it's still volatile relative to the US dollar, but that's because it's volatile going upwards for the most part. Um, so yeah, that's one thing is to not have enough in crypto and not have enough assets under management. Um, and then, yeah, of course, you know, standard things like you worry about catastrophic bugs. I mean, like every time you send a, a transaction, you always just stress, you know. <laughs> but it, it, it's funny that we, we, we always, like, again, we're always so focused on that stuff. But once again, blockchain still hasn't been hacked. And it was only, what, 10, 12 years ago that we had a massive financial crisis due to centralization of trust in really these, these, these hugely vulnerable um, and, and fragile entities that, that actually aren't as smart and intelligent as we'd like to think they are. And they didn't manage risk well, and they didn't find efficient ways of getting returns based on their operational models, obviously the banks, right, the Demon Brothers, etc. So it's like, I think the, the, the reverse is always true. I think that we forget how important different crypto is, um, and then we make some kind of mistake where we actually, like, abandon the right thing. And that's why I agree with Vitalik. Basically, you should be building, developing, you know, speaking to more people, getting more people on board before it's too late. You know, maybe the economic system collapses before we have an alternative in place. You know? that, that's sort of like my contrarian answer. But again, like sort of more down to earth stuff. Yeah, you know, we worry about Bitcoin going to zero and not diversifying to cash fast enough or something like that. <laughs> okay, perfect. No, I like that. I like that. And, and Louis, I see you've got a big smile on your face. Uh, what, are your, what are your views? What are, what are the biggest, yeah, look, I mean, I, I mean, okay, completely separate to Revex. I mean, like, I, I'm not really worried about much because, I mean, this is the point of the game. Like, they, we will be here in three years talking about a different problem. Or we'll be there in seven years talking about a different problem. Um, and really, once you realize that we're all here because we like dealing with problems, mm -hmm. we'll eventually succeed at the problems you like dealing with. Like it's, it's kind of like we wouldn't be doing anything else, right? Um, from a Revix perspective, I would say if you look at the overall market in general, I mean, we're looking at um, 
you're looking at kind of the the growth of an early stage industry that it is attempting to break the bounds of your normal geographic control of governments in a large sense, right? I mean, and you have these different countries who some of them are realizing they're actually not as powerful as some of the corporates, right? Uh, and the way they actually control people in their jurisdiction is becoming less and less becoming less and less able to do so based on the power of them like Google or Facebook and things like that, or less and less equipped to actually regulate correctly, right? And they're kind of slowing things down and I, I get why they're doing that because at the end of the day, like the startup in South Africa, essentially their only job is to make sure that we don't have like hyperinflation and the whole financial system goes to ruin, right? So for them taking 10 years extra to figure out exactly how to deal with cryptocurrency is like, they're like, just chill, whatever, right? From our perspective, and looking at what what we see as the future of the next 10 to 20 years is a complete rebasing of the classical financial system and, and the, the actual tracking of ownership of assets onto blockchain rails, which is where we will be waiting. Depending on how long that takes is, I mean, one of the factors, the key factors of how long that will take is how willing and able regulators are to accept the changes in the market, right? So from our perspective, it is literally just the speed and regulation and getting onto that boat as quickly as possible. Um, like I said earlier, like I cannot see another way the universe pans out with the efficiencies of a public blockchain versus a private blockchain, even if you're going to go and throw, I mean, even the current system, even if you're going to go and throw in everything about identity needs to be tracked and all of that, all the building blocks are, are like on the way. I just can't see a different way. The only way that you could hold it back is by like limiting banking licenses in South Africa. I mean, just like limit it. Like, and then you have like four big banks or five big banks or seven banks or three banks that are coming now playing for the same market. And nobody can really get a go at building a better product, which is what we are trying to do. Okay. Okay. No, cool. No, great, look, great answer. Nice. Well, well, guys, look, I, I mean, I'm just looking at the time and we've, we've hit nine o'clock here <laughs> in South Africa, which means I've kept you for an hour and a half if you include our, our little, you know, introduction of we were chatting beforehand. So I just want to say, yeah, thank you so much for, for taking the time to be part of this, be part of this podcast. Um, what I'm, I'm going to be doing is putting links to both of your companies and both of you to your Twitter or whatever social media you want, uh, you know, send those to me. I will be putting them in the, the link of both the YouTube video as well as the podcast description that we are setting up so that people, yeah, they can follow you on various social media and, you know, have a link if they want to invest or, or get involved further. So I just want to say, <laughs> so yeah, I just want to say thank you so much, guys, and I hope you have uh, have a great evening, and yeah, we'll chat soon. Awesome. No, thanks, and Louis, Louis, keep up the great work. It's, it's great to still see you in the game, Likewise, and uh, yeah, I'll see you at another event and another talk. Thank you so much, Michael. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Cheers, guys. Bye.